I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Kim Liu, the Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of Carnegie Corporation, where she's responsible for the investment and oversight of the corporation's $3.5 billion foundation. Kim joined Carnegie in 2007 after spending a dozen years at the Ford Foundation. She's also a trustee of Ariel Investments, the board chair of the Stevens Cooperative Schools, and a member of the investment committees of the Girl Scouts of America and the ACLU. Last year, Institutional Investor awarded Kim the Endowment and Foundation CIO of the Year. Our conversation covers the American dream story of Kim's parents, Kim's path to picking technology stocks and venture capital managers at Ford Foundation, two very different models of successful foundation investing, a blow-by-blow of the creation of an atypical co-CIO seat at Carnegie, responsibilities that CIOs hate, idiosyncratic investments, committee meetings that foster long-term thinking, evolution of a farm team of managers, risk-taking in investing in life, and what to do when you turn 50 years old. Please enjoy my conversation with Kim Liu. As you know, I've had a bunch of conversations with a bunch of CIOs, and it turns out that I have yet to find any two CIOs that have the same background. Oh, of course. And you are clearly no exception to that rule. So why don't we start for you early, early on? All right. And I just, I love hearing... All the go way back. back to birth? Maybe even your parents. My parents. Okay. Yeah. That's a good story. So my father is a Chinese immigrant from Canton or Guangzhou. He came here to the United States through Hong Kong and Canada when he was about six years old. And very stereotypically, his family owned a grocery store and a cleaners in Harlem where he met my mom who lived in the housing projects across the street from the grocery store that he worked in and lived above when he came here with his family. So the two of them have only ever dated each other. They started dating when they were- How old, yeah, how old were they? They started dating when they were about 13. They had me when they were 17. Wow. And they're still married. And they're still together. And it's a really amazing relationship to watch over time. So they had me at 17. My father then left and went to Vietnam, and so he was gone for about three years. So from when I was maybe one till four, he was in Vietnam. And when he came back, they got married, and then they moved to the Bronx, and I stayed with my grandmother for another year or so until they could sort of get themselves together. They had to wait until they were 21 to get married because you had to have someone sign in order for you to get married below 21. And he didn't have anybody who was willing to sign for him because his family actually disowned him for being with my mom. And so as soon as they were able to get married, they got married and they've been together since. And so I was born, like I said, when they were 17. And then my brother was born when they were 24 because they had to wait till they were adults. Imagine that. A (laughs) 24-year-old thinks that they're an adult. So so, um, it's great. And how did that impact like your schooling growing up? So probably the biggest thing I think is that my education was hugely important for my family. Huge, especially my father. And you know, people talk about tiger moms. I had a tiger dad. And my mom was sort of the peacemaker to keep it all from getting too far away. And so actually the probably the biggest impact it had on my schooling, quite honestly, was my decision to go to Penn. My father had a very typical immigrant feelings about certain things. And at the time, he worked as a clerk at AT AT&T. And Charlie Brown, who was the president of AT AT&T at the time, had gone to Wharton. And he was like, you're going to Wharton because if it's good enough for Charlie Brown, it's good enough for you. We didn't know anything about that place. But that's where I applied. And that's where I went. And I, I was going to Bronx Science here in the city at the time. So it wasn't crazy. I mean, everybody, I knew what the Ivies were. But getting to that particular place had everything to do with it. And I will say, 
I went for a school visit to visit Penn and loved it the moment I was on campus. Why? Because I think that, you know, I was a city kid from the Bronx and Harlem, and I had never traveled any place or gone any place before, and it just felt more familiar. We had gone to Princeton on the same trip, and it just was too foreign to me, and it just did not feel comfortable. Was there anything in your formative years that led to business from being around, whether it's grocery and dry cleaning or AT&T? So it's so funny because I actually, when I was applying to high school, I at the time, there was a high school in New York, John F. Kennedy High School in the Bronx, that had a dental program. And if you graduated from that high school, you graduated already able to be a dental assistant. And I wanted to be a dentist. And why did I want to be a dentist? Because it seemed like a good job. And I wanted to be a doctor. I was at Bronx Science, and I was good at science and math, and I wanted to be a doctor. And I didn't like blood. So I was like, I can't. I was like, I'll either be an eye doctor or I'll be a dentist. And this program came along, and I was like, I'm going to do that. And my father was like, stop it. That's ridiculous. You're not going to be a dental assistant. You're not going to be a dentist. And, you know, and there went from So what was the first job out of college? Chemical bank. Like one of those training programs? Exactly. Uh. And it was a great program. Those programs back then were amazing. They really taught you how to be an analyst. You know, there was the investment banking programs, which were different, but the commercial banking programs and just learning credit. I was an accounting and an organizational behavior major. And because I loved accounting, but I went for my first accounting interview and the person I interviewed with interviewed me the whole time in the fetal position. And I was like, this personality and that person is never going to match. So I need to find another use for this accounting degree. And everybody was like, try commercial banking. Maybe that'll be a good fit. And it was. And I loved it. How long did you stay before you went to business school? Three years. Okay. And then right. And then. And then I went to HBS. Yeah. And, you know, quite honestly, I loved the work, but it was a tough environment. So it was time for me to leave. So what was HBS like for you? I didn't want to go to HBS. I wanted to go back to Penn. I wanted to go to Stanford, and I got waitlisted at Stanford. And then I got, and I got into Penn, I got to Harvard, and I said, I'm going back to Wharton. I did an amazing job there. People know me, love me. It felt comfortable. It was home. And my, again, my dad was like, it's crazy. You've done that. You've got to try something different. And quite honestly, I went because I really struggled with public speaking, really struggled with public speaking. And I thought... If I go to HBS, it's going to force me. Yeah, throw you in the deep end. And I'm going to have to speak. And then that's going to make the difference for me. It didn't work. I almost <laughs> looped I almost looped a couple of classes because I struggled with raising my hand. And I remember they probably still had it when you were the Big E class, yeah. business government. Yeah. Yep. In this generation. So I can't remember the professor's name, but I took Big E and he called. We had our first midterm he, or exam. He called me into his office. And he said, I was reading the exams. And I, then I came to your exam. And I was shocked at how well you had done on this exam because you've never raised your hand. He goes, I am going to fail you. You will loop this class if you don't stop raising your hand. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and it was the sheer panic of it. Uh, but I, and I still, it was painful for me every single time. Yeah. But I thought that this was how I was going to break free. And, you know, it was a, it and so was when tough. you broke out of that institution, mm-hmm. what was next? Escape. I escaped there and I went to Prudential and I did private placements. So I went there originally, well, I graduated in 92. Now I should say my every year that I graduated it's, or I change jobs is a sign that something bad's going to happen. I graduated from college in 87. The market fell apart. 92, horrible market. Yeah, it was. So. Prudential had been a really good place to go because they did a lot of creative stuff. The, they, you know, really a lot of structuring, a lot of bond stuff. Things had fallen apart, and they went down to re- only doing lending, basically. It became plain vanilla. It just wasn't an interesting job. It, it was just like being back in commercial banking. And worse yet, they fired a bunch of people. They honored the offers from the three of us that they'd given offers to, but they had fired a bunch of people. So it was a pretty hostile environment and I had five managing directors in the 22 months I was there so I knew that this was not gonna work and so I started looking for a job and what happened I had been and tell me if you know anything about this program there was a big brother big sister program at HBS do you remember that yeah sure so my little brother ended up being this guy named Perry Fagan 
And Perry Fagan's mother was a woman named Betty Fagan, who was the director of research at the Ford Foundation. And Perry knew nothing about finance or investing. Or what his mother did. Or what his mother did. But he (laughs) said, my mother's looking for somebody and she does investments. You should call her and maybe you can work with her. And I, I had been doing fixed income at Prudential and they were looking for an equity analyst to follow the tech sector. It couldn't be more different than what I was doing. But I went to talk to his mom. We hit it off. And I mean, just she was an amazing, amazing woman. I lay at her feet sort of a lot of who I became as an investor. And she was the luck that you need to be successful, right? You know, like people think it's all skill. She was so much my luck. So she and I hit it off. She had me meet with Linda Strump, who was the CIO at the time. Linda and I got along. And then they introduced me to a gentleman named Hal Clark, who was the portfolio manager for the public equity portfolio. Because at the time, Ford managed a huge, a third of their book was managed internally, people picking stocks. And that's what they were hiring for. And so Betty agreed, if they hired me, to have me have a dotted line reporting relationship to her. So she was like, I'll teach her the business. And she'll report to Hal, who was the, the portfolio manager, but she'll also, every, she'll run everything by me. First. What and was her role there? She was the director of research and head of private equity. Head of private equity. Okay. So director of all research yeah. and head of private equity. She had been the person who picked the tech stocks. So she, the role that they hired me for was her job and director of research. But then she decided to do private equity and that's why they were hiring. And so she said, I'll help her and I'll work with her and it'll be fine. And so the first, maybe second day that I was there, first or second day I was there, she sat me down and she was like, look, you're never going to be good at this job if you don't take risks. We're in the business of taking risks. You do not have to be right all the time. You only have to be right 51% of the time, and you can be great at this job. And more importantly, if you mess up, I'll fix it. So just go <laughs> out and make some investments and do some research, run some models. It'll be great. And, you know, and I was obviously super worried. I was an accounting and organizational behavior major, not a computer science major or or engineer or anything. I knew nothing about anything that had to do with technology. I went to my first conference, maybe the second or third day of me working at the Ford Foundation, and they kept talking about ATM. And I was like, what does a cash machine have to do with what they're talking about? And obviously, they were not talking about (laughs) cash machines. I was completely lost. But she took a chance, and I felt so beholden to the fact that she was taking this chance on me, that I worked late, I killed myself. And I was like, I'm going to make her proud. I'm going to make her feel like this risk that she's taken was a good risk to take. And so and it, it was easy because my, all my friends were investment bankers, right? And I worked at the Ford Foundation where everybody went home at 5 o'clock because this was everyone's final job before they retired. No one stuck around. And so... I stayed until, you know, nine or 10 o'clock because none of my friends came, got out of work until nine or 10 because they were investment bankers. And what was I going to go home for? So it looked like I was working really hard when I thought, what else am I going to do? And, and so it ended up being an amazing experience. And I had a conversation with her maybe about six months ago and we were talking and I'm, I made this point to her, like how important that relationship was to me and that I was so grateful for her. And I it was just a you know, thanking her for that. And she was like, I don't know what you're talking about. She was like, I didn't take a chance on you. She was like, you were better educated than I was when I started this. You had more experience. You've done more. I don't know why you saw it that way because I didn't see it that way. And it was a total perspective because, in fact, she did take a chance. But she was like, I learned it. I figured you could. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's so really, the importance yeah. of having people like that in your life is a tremendous. And yeah. so I'm forever thankful and and I think because of that, I'm, I feel an incredible obligation to do that for other people and to, to serve in a, a mentoring role and to really commit to that with people. Yeah. So how long did you spend just doing equity technology investing? Seven years. And then what happened? And then she retired. It was just short of seven years, about six and a half. So six and a half years, she retired. She came to me and she said, I'm retiring. Eric Dobstadt is going to be the person who takes over the private portfolio because he had been working with her for three years. She had brought him up from legal to work with her in private. And she goes, but he's never been an a investor. And the way Ford managed their portfolio at the time, it was very siloed. And so 
the private portfolios, distributed tech stocks were managed by the private portfolio. And she said, he's not done investing in public markets before. So I want you to come over and do manage that distribution portfolio. And at the time, I hadn't told them yet, but I was pregnant with my first daughter. And I said, I'm pregnant. I don't, I don't know if this is the right time for me to do this. And she said, it's fine. And my daughter was due in May or end of April of, the, of 2000. Yeah. And <laughs> Just put the math together. <laughs> end of May of 2000. And Betty was retiring December of 99. So they wanted me to start in January of 2000. That's why I thought I'm not even going to be that here that long before I go maternity leave. I'm not sure if this is the right thing to do. So at the time, this was before Reg FD. I was on the road all the time and I followed the technology industry. So I was working late a lot because they would do stock announcements late at night for all the reasons you can imagine. So I thought this is going to be a better job because I'm not going to have to travel as much. It's a long-term asset class, even though it's stock picking, it'll be a better fit for me with a small baby. So I said yes, and I moved over, and the world fell apart. And I wish I could say that I was a brilliant investor, but again, here I will talk about the importance of luck because I was pregnant, and we literally had about $1.9 billion in our distribution portfolio because the distributions were coming so fast that we literally were losing stock certificates because people were sending them in the mail. And back then, the transfer agents were not efficient. They couldn't handle the volume of distributions. And so I thought to myself, I'm going on maternity leave. I need to sell everything before I leave because they're coming so fast that by the time I get back from maternity leave, there'll be a whole new portfolio to manage. And I can't have this portfolio be $3 billion while I'm gone. So I'm going to sell it. So as you know, I wish I could say it was brilliant, but I got $1.8 billion sold before the world fell apart. And I told them all the time if I was still in the public portfolio, that's what I would have done. Yeah, of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. So as a result, I went on maternity leave. I came back and the world was different. And there wasn't a distribution portfolio anymore. And so I started investing in private equity and venture funds. And at the time, Ford had a particularly large venture portfolio. The board in prior iterations had been a lot of captains of industry who had been the victims of hostile takeovers. And so they felt that the LBO market was unsavory. So they did not allow the Ford Foundation to invest in buyouts, but they would let them invest in venture. So they had a huge venture portfolio and not a very big buyout portfolio. And so that's why they had so much in distributions. So they're trying to diversify the buyout portfolio. So that was a a good time to be there. There was stuff to be done. We also had just a very big venture portfolio we had to figure out what to do with now that things had come undone. So it was a good time to try something new. So if you dive into, now they call it private equity, but the old buyout portfolio then, so almost 20 years ago, geez. um, What was it like in sourcing managers? If you compare that to picking up something relatively new today or trying to put capital to work in a new area today and sourcing new managers today? There weren't nearly as many source of capital back then as there are now. And so the competition for getting into these things was very different. And also, as much as the foundation and endowment community is the bit insular now, it was even more so at the time. So for sure, if you were at another foundation and you found this great manager, you would tell your peers at other foundations, I found this great manager, you should look at them too. Now, not everybody did everything together, obviously, but part of your sourcing was other people. And those managers didn't have a lot of options because the pension funds weren't investing at the time. We didn't have all the sovereign wealth money. We had corporates in, we had strategics in, in some way, but it was a very different environment. And so the foundations in the endowment community had a lot more leverage. So you had leverage with managers. That's what made them become known as the smart money because you were doing these sort of more interesting structures and strategies. Very different than it is now. Yeah. And you didn't have to necessarily sell yourself the way that you're sort of in a position where you have to sell why you are better than others. The concept of 
the foundations being really steady and reliable sources of capital was prevalent and everybody believed that it changed after 2008 when people were not as stable of source of capital but at the time every buyout fund wanted the foundations in it and so people came to you too lots of over the transom ppms and that's still the case we still get tons of things over the transom it's just that they have other options now and so the power dynamic is different now i know that in that period of time i guess one of those peers that you spent time talking to was meredith jenkins yes and at some point in time you didn't retire but you did leave the ford foundation so it's interesting because even though Meredith came into the business after I did, we came to the private equity business together at the same time. So she joined Ellen Schumann in 99. And remember, I started in end of 99, beginning of 2000. So we came to the business at the same time. Ford was a lot bigger than Carnegie is, was and is a lot bigger. And so we had more of a portfolio. I think when they started, when out they had one buyout and one venture manager and they were building out a portfolio and so we became friends because we would co-invest in things together and we had kids around the same age as each of our oldest are a year apart and our youngest are a year apart and so you know we just we just happened to have a lot of things going on at the same time and so when she was leaving to go to Hong Kong she called me and she said Ellen has an ad out for an analyst, but I bet if you were willing to come, she would make it a director's position. So you should come and speak to her. And it would be great because I'm going to stay as an advisor. It will be great to work together. So you should talk to Ellen. And I'd known Ellen, not as well as I knew Meredith, but I knew her. And so Ellen and I spent a couple of months talking to each other. And it literally, I had come back from maternity leave in January from my second kid. And Things were different at Ford, and I knew that I was going to have to start looking for something else. And it felt like, here it is. It's coming just at the right the time. serendipity, yeah. It was such serendipity. And she called me. And I think had it not been for that, I might not have even thought about it. But I did. And then I literally left in May. Shockingly, 13 years to the day of when I started the Ford Foundation. Actually, my last day was my first day. 13 years earlier. And then I started at, at Carnegie. And what was different in the investment thinking? Everything. I have never met two organizations that were more different in the way they thought about things. So, we, yeah, so, describe some of those differences. So at the time, the Ford Foundation was run very much in the traditional mode of running portfolios. Linda at the time didn't believe in hedge funds. The private equity portfolio was 10%. That was it. She felt very strongly that anything that you could do in these alternative markets, you could do with public securities. You just had to weight them the right way and think about your portfolio construction. So it was a very traditional 70, 30, maybe, maybe 60, 30, 10 portfolio. And do you think she's right? Because now more and more we're starting to hear about liquid alternatives and low-cost replacements for hedge funds and even private equity. What do you think? I think there's a million ways to make money. It's all in how you implement a strategy and how consistent you are and what skill set you have. So I think managing a portfolio the way she managed that portfolio means that you have to believe you are skilled at tactical allocation because you have to move that portfolio around a lot. So you have to have tactical skills and you have to have a team that has tactical skills. You have to know a lot more about derivatives and structuring, different thing. For sure, there are people who are good at that and they can make money at that. And it'll be a much more volatile portfolio. And sometimes I say to myself, well, foundation can take volatility because our 5% is based on whatever our assets are. So it is a variable number. And so maybe, in fact, foundations could manage money and Ford Foundation did manage money that way. Whereas Ellen had come from Yale. She believed in the endowment model or the Yale model, and it was a highly diversified portfolio and a lot of idiosyncratic investments in it. So strategic-wise, they were opposites. Ellen ran the portfolio as one portfolio with, yes, there were people who headed certain asset classes, but there was a 
internal investment committee that looked at everything. And so everybody knew about everything and things were traded off against each other. At the Ford Foundation, it was run in silos. And as a result of it being run in silos, what happened in one portfolio had nothing to do with what happened in another portfolio. So sometimes they didn't work in tandem. There was delegation at the Ford Foundation. There wasn't delegation at Carnegie. Carnegie had a real reverence and appreciation for its founder in a way that the Ford Foundation did not. And I think that translated into the relationship between investments and the program area and ultimately into how investments were done. In some respects, all of that fed into each other. I think that fact fed into how they chose their leaders and how the program changed because the Ford Foundation's program and what they did has changed a lot pretty dramatically where Carnegie's has not. And I think that when you have that kind of long-term consistency of thought, it translates into how you think about your portfolio management too. You can think this, we've been doing the same thing for a hundred years. When the investment people say we're investing for a hundred years, in our minds, we can appreciate that. When the president has been the president for 20 years, you can think of it that way. I think at organizations where the leadership changes a lot, where the strategy of the overall organization changes more often, it's harder to see things long-term. So I think all of that translated into different strategies for managing the portfolio. And how did that play out in terms of actual decision-making and the decision-making process on any individual decision? With respect to investment decisions or with respect to- Investment decisions, yeah. So Carnegie has a investment committee made up of both board members and advisors. And every investment decision is presented to the investment committee for approval. Now, the committee is very well aware that we have hired professional managers who know this market well. They trust those managers. And so in the whole time that I've been here, and as far as I know ever, there's only been one investment that did not get through committee, whereas the Ford Foundation, nothing goes to committee except for public at the time. I think it's different. So I'm speaking about history. Public managers over a certain threshold. I think it might have been like $200 million. Everything else was done just by the CIO. And so that creates very different dynamics just by nature of it. Different documentation, different institutional histories, different relationship with managers in many respects. So they're very different. I mean, I had, it was a privilege to work at two places that had arguably been successful, but did it very different yeah, ways. Yeah. Now, over this period of time, you know, Ellen eventually left, and you and Meredith were put in a seat that you know, not many are, co-CIO. I guess unless you have Goldman Sachs and you're the co-head of some desk. And she had Goldman Sachs experience, and she did. I did not. And so I thought this was bananas. <laughs> just, I, I mean, just I could not believe that they had put us in this position. So the chair of our investment committee was a Goldman Sachs person. Mm-hmm. A wise decision that they made was, We're going to look at the internal candidates first. If we believe that the internal candidates have the capacity to manage this portfolio, we will not do a search. If we don't, then we will do a search. So I think very quickly they decided either one of these two people could do this. They will need support, but they could do it. So we don't have to do an external search. And then my guess is, And so I don't know, my guess is that there was disagreement on what to do about that. And so Jeff, having spent a significant part of his career at Goldman, thought the CIO, this co-CIO thing has worked in the past, and he recommended it. And I think it was kind of split the baby. We're going to split this baby. We're going to give them both this title and tell them to work it out. And there was a lot of people on the committee who thought this is not good, who expressed to us, we're giving this a try. We don't have a lot of confidence in this, but we're going to give it a try. Our president brought us both in together, and he was like, this is odd. (laughs) I don't know if this works, but I delegated this responsibility to a committee, and this is the committee's recommendation, and it is not for me to second-guess the committee. So I don't know how you guys are going to make this work. Good luck. Go with God kind of thing. And it was... 
So, so you guys lock are. yourselves in, a, in an office, a conference room. So it's important to say yeah. we shared an office all through this process. So through while we were interviewing, we were sharing an office. Wow. And so it'd be like, okay, so who are you going to see today? Oh, I'm going to see so-and-so. And so, you know, it was both uncomfortable and comfortable because this is my friend, right? Yeah. And there was a part of me that wished her well, even though I wanted to get the job. And I'm sure it was the same thing with her. She wanted the job, but this is her friend. She, she wished me well. So we, we kind of lock ourselves in a room and it was presented to us in a way that we could not say no, quite honestly. So we both said, yeah, I guess this could work. And come to each other and said, this is crazy. And I mean, we, <laughs> we sat down and we were like, this is crazy. And then we went back and forth, like, how are we going to decide on this? How are we going to do this? And, then, and, and we actually had a conversation. If this doesn't work, three years from now, one of us will leave. And that, honestly, I thought it would be me. Because this was Meredith's home, right? She had been working at... Carnegie, basically her whole career, not that she hadn't worked other places, but the bulk of her career had been at Carnegie. She loved it. And I had moved around and I had worked other places. And, and I had said to her explicitly, if this is painful and this is a threat to our friendship, I will leave and we'll be fine kind of thing. So let's just sit down and figure out how we make this work for the two of us. And what were those key sort of either division of responsibilities or how did you make it work? So I think there were two big tenants that drove how we structure it. One, we each had to be managing a full diverse portfolio so that when we went out to interview for jobs later on, we could say we had played the role of a CIO managing a cross asset class. So it wasn't a, you do publics and I do privates or you do illiquids. And, you know, we just, we wanted to divide it down the middle. So we each got a private part of the private portfolio and we each got part of the public portfolio, but there was a lot of Fluidity. Was there any thought in your head that that almost, I'm thinking like a principal agent problem, even though you're, you are principals, but you're also agents for Carnegie, and now you're dividing something up that and not clearly the most benefits way. both of you, but may not be the most efficient way. Right. It was, at least for me, she's a much more generous person. But for me, I was like, you put us in this position, we're going to make it work for ourselves. Like, we're not going to not be good fiduciaries, but you've created a situation that we're both kind of stuck. And so we're going to make the best of this. And so she took on emerging markets because she had been in the emerging markets and I took developed markets, but she took Japan and I took Latin America. So we each had both had emerging and developed and we both had different parts of the public market. I took long short, she took event driven opportunistic, but there was some relationships in this long short that she had a close relationship and she kept and there was some of the event drum. Well, you graduated said, HPS yeah. in 92, so that was Hedge Fund Central. Oh, my God. And there are a ton of them, a ton of yeah. them in my class. And she did real estate and resources, and I did privates and venture. And the way we structured it is, though, if you were the primary, your job was to really help the directors source and think about their strategy and support them in their work. And if you were the secondary, you were the devil's advocate. Not the devil's advocate in that I am going to second guess the quality of your underwriting, but the devil's advocate in I am playing an asset allocation role. So you've recommended this thing. Have you thought about whether this is a better way to get that exposure? Here is this venture manager in healthcare, but here's this in the public market. We get more liquidity, so there's more volatility. What do we care? We healthcare can manager the, in the public you know. market. Yeah, yeah so yeah. We, your job was to know other ways that you could possibly – get access to the same sort of exposure, taking on either lower fees or more liquidity or whatever, or just maybe a better match for the portfolio, a more aligned manager. So it's devil's advocacy in that way. And so that went along actually pretty well. And then the things that everyone hates about being a CIO, we, drew, we divided which, which, them. And what are those things? As you roll your eyes into the microphone. Oh, my God. <laughs> performance appraisals. Not the, even the actual doing of performance appraisals. The writing up of performance appraisals. So we would divide those. Someone had to do a budget every year. So one year she'd do the budget. The next year I would do the budget. The audit. So someone had to be responsible for the audit. We'd switch back and forth on the audit. Signing contracts. So one year I signed contracts. Just all that stuff that's not investment decisions. 
we just divided them. And so that was wonderful. And the, and the things that we worried about that could potentially divide us as a, in a partnership was largely the relationship with the investment committee. We did all those meetings together. And we were very careful about not meeting ever with a member of the investment committee without the other one. And so people couldn't have favorites. They had to take us as a package. And I think that made a huge difference. And I think that we could have been partners forever because you, you, know, you think about any of our fund managers who have partnerships, but I don't think the team could have handled that partnership forever. So Why is it, that? when you have a top heavy organization, it puts natural pressure on both the compensation and the responsibilities that you can give to junior people on the team. And we have a highly talented team. Eventually they were gonna feel like they were being impinged upon. And so when we hired them, they were young in their careers. So having your CIO follow you around to meetings wasn't so offensive because you know you could learn from them and it was great. But after you've been doing it for five years, why are you still going with me to meetings? So the good thing about it is that right around the time when it started to be uncomfortable for them, and no one ever expressed it, but it was clear that they did not need us in the same way that they needed us when they were, when we first became CIOs. We both had the opportunity to take on a lot of outside responsibilities. So board roles and just steering committees. We were, we both took mentorship very seriously with other young women in the industry and me particularly people who are calling the industry and all of that became really important to us. And I'm not sure we would have been able to do it if we had been sole CIOs because it would not have become a part of our every day. And then I don't know that you think about it later on if it hasn't been an everyday thing for you. So from the beginning, we took on these added things. So then once we became sole CIOs at different places, we kept them going because they had already fit into who we were. And so that was a gift because we, at least I know for me, and I know based on the things that Meredith has done, that those outside responsibilities have been hugely impactful to us. Yeah, and what, we're better what's an managers. an example of sort of one of those that you've done and that's really helped you out? So I chair the board of my kids' school. And, you know, the business of running a school is incredibly tricky. And so all of the sort of the people management issues and the resource scarcity issues and the conflicts between the product you're selling versus how you manage the parents, which is arguably different than the relationship with students, sort of helps you to think about the relationship you have, LPs and GPs, and how people are coming from different perspectives. And you really have to try to put yourself in other people's seats and think about how resource constraints impact people's behavior and, and the way they do things. And it, it actually, it was, it was really good for me. And, and because of the work that we do, we don't really manage businesses. We manage organizations, but not businesses. So seeing the actual management of a business was really important to me. And I got involved in a lot of, I'm on the investment committee of the ACLU. And so in addition to their endowed assets, there's a pension fund. And I think one of the big issues about between foundations and pension funds is to just so understand each other. So serving on, I was on both on the ACLU's investment committee and the Girl Scouts, both of which it was pension assets, gave me a whole different perspective on the decision making of pension funds and things that we oftentimes think doesn't make sense. I don't know why they do that. It doesn't make sense. But then when you're managing or you're on an investment committee of one of those institutions, you know exactly why they're doing it. Yeah, and so, it totally so give, makes give sense. an example of something like that. So I keep saying to myself, I couldn't understand as a foundation investor why they're buying all this fixed income. Why are you buying all these long bonds? It doesn't make sense. But then you understand liability matching and you see, and then I say to myself, oh no, that those, those rates are going to be low for a long time because that demand for that long bond is so high. And so when I'm thinking about rates rising and people kept saying it was going to happen, it was going to happen. And I was like, it's going to happen a lot slower than you think it's going to happen. And so that is a positive effect on how we thought about managing assets here. And so it was things like that that I think both of us had. You know, she did different things than I did, but for sure, we'd come back and we'd share what we learned at our committee meetings and both with the team or just with each other. And it helped expand relationships. They had different managers than we had. It was a different sourcing than we might otherwise have had. 
it was really valuable to us. And like I said, I don't think we would have been able to do it if we had been sole CIOs. We just, it would have been too overwhelming. Just all of the other work takes so many hours. Right, of course. But now you step into the sole CIO role and therefore you have to do the audits every year. Yeah. You have to do the performance assessments every year. How much is your day-to-day shifted and what does it look like now compared to the different stages through your career? I've hired people a little bit more support to help. I also don't spend as much time going to manager meetings as I did before. I spend a little bit more time thinking about asset allocation and strategy than I we arguably did before. And so even though these administrative aspects of the job take up so much more time than they did before, I've stolen from time that the directors are happy I don't do anymore. Like I try to go to a few meetings with each of them a year and I go to, if you're doing a new manager, I go to that. But so I've taken away some investment work that I'd done before. And how do you feel about how you're able to kind of impart your judgment onto investment decisions when you're less in the weeds than you were? So I think that one of the things that I have found over time that is you have a really good team and you have a really good strategy and people know the strategy and they own the strategy and you sit down as a group and you stay consistent in that strategy, you don't have to spend as much time telling people that this is a bad investment because they know it doesn't fit what we've talked about. So what is your strategy here? So I'm as much of a Swenson acolyte as anybody else, right? I think the whole concept of the endowment model is right for the type of investing that we do and for the type of skills that we have and for the fact that we are able to educate our committee in such a way that they don't need us to hug a benchmark, right? So all that makes the endowment model a good one for us. I think that one of the things that Swenson has been brilliant about is evolving what that means to him over time. And I think one of the things I try to pay special attention to is the basic framework of an endowment model makes sense, but we can't execute an endowment model the way Swenson does because we are not Yale. And there are things that are just by its very nature inherently benefits to them that we don't have. We don't have any inflows of capital. First off, we have zero inflows of capital. We are three and a half billion dollars, which means our check size are tiny. So we As much as I would love to be able to put managers in business by giving them enough money, we're never going to give them enough money to do that. But what we can do is look for idiosyncratic small things that the big guys just can't do. So, for instance, we did a manager in Peru, and there were tons of people that were trying to figure out how to invest in Peru, but there was so much money that they were disrupting the market, right? But we did a manager that had a $20 million fund, and we did 10 of it. We can do that. Yale can't do that. It doesn't make sense. I mean, they could do it. They have the skills to do it, but it's not a good use of their time, right? So we spend a lot more time looking for that type of idiosyncratic risk. We do go earlier, and we will invest in managers when they're not quite proven and where the manager is too small for some of the big guys to think they want to play there just yet. But we're looking for efficiencies, and we're looking for ways that we leverage the fact that we don't have a real need to be close to a benchmark and that we do have patient capital and we're willing to let you have highly concentrated portfolios that will do strange things and we will either figure out how to make that work in our total portfolio or we'll figure out how to educate the committee and the rest of the organization so that people don't get nervous about it. And so while we spent a lot of time just going into inefficient asset classes now, I think we spend much more time looking at just things are just different, just odd. You know, we went into Argentina before the Argentinian elections, which everybody thought was crazy, but we did the work that showed us that no matter who won, here's how the market was undervalued and we could do that. And and do we think that you can stay invested in Argentina over long cycles? No, we're going to have to eventually take our money out of that. But do we think that it's long enough for the work that it takes us to do to get in? Yes. So... We do a lot of looking thematically that feels like at the time it's not necessarily going to lead to investment, but it will over time. So 
we went to Latin America in 2012 to do the work on Latin America. We didn't actually make the Peru and Argentina investments until 2015 and 2014 and maybe I think 2016, so really late. And we just sort of invested some time in doing the work so that we know what it looked like when it came kind of thing. And so we're doing a lot of that. And one of the things that I love doing is that for every investment committee, in order to remind the committee that we're long-term, we do a panel on something that is unrelated to the portfolio, but we just think this is an interesting trend you should start thinking about. So what are some on, of the ones you've done recently? We did one on demographics. We did one on the retail sector where we had people talk about how retail was going to evolve over time. We had someone come in and talk about contagions and how diseases spread and what that meant. We had someone come in and talk about active versus passive, which is a here right now, more of a here right now phenomenon. But sometimes they're really, we're doing one on cryptocurrency. We did one on the future of work and what robots could replace and what they couldn't replace. And we did one on real estate and how self-driving cars and the way millennials think about housing would change how cities were built. So sort of an urban design kind of thoughts. And so all those don't affect right now investments, but they will have us look for sort of weird off the run type of investments and make us think about what might be coming. Um, so we always dedicate some time to that, which is hard when you have to manage a portfolio right now. But I want the team to come to me with weird stuff. So if you look to your about. portfolio today, roughly, how many different relationships do you have? And then let's just start with that. We have too many relationships, but we have about 120. Okay. Roughly, the way we look at it, eight asset classes. It's roughly 10 or so in each asset. Well, it was more than... 10 to 15, and then there's offshoots from certain. So let's say we had 10 buyout managers, but then maybe we also have 10 U.S. venture, and then we have 10 emerging markets venture. And we, long, short, there'll be 10, and 10 real estate. Then we broke out resources, 10 resources and things like that. So yeah. when you put it all together and wrap it up, probably about And then when you look at the portfolio construction of those buckets, how many do you think fall into this idiosyncratic off the run. Not as much as I would like, but they take a lot of work. So it takes a lot of work managing them and it takes a lot of finding them. But I would say right now, it's probably not more than five or 10% of the portfolio, but do I think it's gonna have to be more? Yes, I think it's gonna have to be more if we're gonna continue to outperform because I think returns are coming down. And if returns are gonna come down and our 5% payout is not coming down, we're just going to have to find different ways to create alpha. And so that's going to have to become a bigger part of the portfolio. And portfolio construction is going to have to become a bigger part of how we gain alpha. Yeah. And so we're going to just have to tweak all the different tools a little bit. So I'm not abandoning the endowment model. I still think it's a great model. It's just the tweaks as we think about how we're going to do that. And so, you know, a lot of times I think about, does that mean that the skill set you looked for in your team has to change? And arguably, yes, right? Like we looked at great manager selectors. This person has expertise in real estate and they know every single person and they'll be able to pick the best real estate manager from the worst real estate manager. And so that's how I chose the real estate person. That's, she's amazing. So now I actually just have to know about the real estate managers. You have to know about the future of city designs and the future of transportation and the future of how all that works. And you have to be able to incorporate that into how you slowly think about how the type of things you invest in and maybe the ancillary things that you invest in, they're still real estate, but they're not exactly real estate. And you got to think about how long it'll take before this actually materializes. And so you have to have a much more macro view and long-term view about how you think about things. And fortunately, I think the team is just intellectually curious. They're sort of people who have been presented with the idea that they have to start thinking about these things and they've been shied away from it. They're like, okay, so let's think about what that means. And so we'll see how it evolves over time. But I think the old model of how you chose your team probably has to change. And I think a little bit of that has to do with, quite honestly, that you need to make sure you have young people on the team in ways that we always thought experience made it 
this career, this job is one where pattern recognition makes a huge difference in your ability to be successful, sort of throwing out the patterns are going to be just as important. Yeah, yes, too, right? but, right. So I think building teams that make sure that you always have an inflow of young talent in is probably more important. Yeah. Not that it always wasn't important, but even more important now. If you come in, right, it's the beginning of the year, you're doing, or the end of the year, you're doing a review of your portfolio, you know where you want to head. You know it's a really long-term pool of capital. And you also know that 90% of it is in a model that, you know, you may likely have high conviction in the individual managers, but you wonder if that's the structure that's going to meet the objectives that you have. And every day I have to wonder that one of them decides that it's no longer the game they want to play. We've seen that, That's right? happening every day. Every yeah. day, especially in the hedge fund space. Right. You know what? I'm closing up shop. I can. I've made money. I don't need to do this anymore. It's not fun anymore. Here's all your money back. Now I got to figure out what to do with all that money you just gave me back. And so, yeah, I got to worry that I need to take away from those managers and those managers may just give it back to me at the worst possible time. Yeah, and so let's just pick on that example. So usually when that happens, you've been involved with an organization, a hedge fund manager for a while, the founder retires. Usually there's a team of people, maybe there's a spin out of that. So now you have this funny decision where you can continue on with a roughly similar strategy, hopefully very talented that's been successful, but that's flying in the face of this notion of, well, we need to shift the portfolio and do something different. So in, a, in an individual decision like that, what do you do? We've looked at both our spin outs and other spin outs and really try to dissect who was innovative in the way they thought about their jobs. We are always shocked at how different the spin outs are from each other. Sometimes they're the same. Sometimes the culture was so strong in the organization that they were in that you were buying the same thing again with a new, maybe slightly less experienced manager. And maybe you, but you feel like they're good enough and they're ready and there's no problem. And if you want that exposure, you can find it. And sometimes you find out there were three people underneath that head person. And each of them thinks about the world slightly different. And one of them is thinking more aligned with the way we see the world going, right? One of them is not as interested in benchmarks. One of them maybe is by dent of their background or their experience, which is not exactly as Wharton HBS as the other, might see the world in a slightly different way. And they're looking at things in a slightly different way. So they're still grounded in what exists right now, but they're open to seeing the world in a different way. And so that there's benefit in that. And so we spend a lot of time. Sometimes we think what we have found is the struggle is that that person is often a horrible people manager. So maybe they struggle with building a team. Maybe the way they think about it is just the way they think about it. And they, they have a hard time imparting those thought processes on anybody else. And so then it's a one man band. And do you want to bet on a one-man band? We are still fiduciaries. What I would do with my own money is not what I would do with Carnegie's money. And so I have to think about whether this makes sense for an institution like ours, which is why sometimes you give a tiny amount of money just to see how this person grows. And sometimes you just watch them because they're just not ready for us yet. And that ties into something you said earlier, where there's this notion of the impact of resource constraints. So the challenge, if everybody wants to just try it out, now you have a manager that might be a little bit subscale and has a different set of stressors than someone who is more of scale and can just go about the process of investing. So how do you weigh so that into your decision making? That is a struggle that we're having right now. If I had to say the thing that about our portfolio that worries me the most, it is when Meredith and I started as co-CIOs, we said we have a succession problem in this portfolio. All of our certain types of managers are of the same vintage year, same age and stage. When they all decide they want to go, they're going to go roughly around the same time and we're going to be screwed. So we're going to start building a farm team of people who do slightly different things, but can play a similar role in portfolio. And we're going to start building. And now what's happening is this vision that we had, you know, seven years ago, six years ago, that maybe things were going to be different is coming true, but we haven't gained enough conviction to give more money to the farm team or enough money. So maybe we've given them more money, but these big guys that we've been with a, a while have 
4% positions. Are we ready to give these guys 4% positions? No. So either we have to decide that we're going to have twice as big a portfolio resource problem, or we're going to decide that we're going to take a leap and give these guys that we feel good about, but not great about more money. Or we're going to just dig in and feel great about them. So we're trying to figure out who we need to feel great about and give them meaningful position sizes to and figure out who we think is next to give us money back. Yeah. Is that um, dynamic prevalent in any other asset classes? I think it's prevalent in all the asset classes, even in our venture portfolio. They are for sure. I think the great venture managers have thought about succession. They've done succession. They shared networks, they've shared institutional knowledge, the entrepreneur community cares about them and they want to be a part of them. And so they have a natural sourcing advantage and they're great and they're going to be great. But in order to feed the beast, they've got to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where what you invested in originally is very different than what they are now, which doesn't mean they won't be highly successful, but the role in portfolio is different. And so you got to take a chance. So it's, again, it's a vintage year thing. It's an agent stage in the organization's life and in the manager's life. And so you have to think about adding in new talent at the bottom. And we're doing that in everyone. But every time, yeah, the first time we invest in the venture manager, we make a $5 million investment. We make a $10 million investment. It takes a while to feel comfortable giving somebody a 15 or $20 million investment but they invest over time. And so it can take a long time to build them up to even close to size of the manager that you started with seven or eight years ago. And so it, I don't think there is an asset class where we are not experiencing that dynamic and trying to figure out how to do that. But it's a nice challenge, right? And I think the challenge, that's why I love this job. I love my job because there's a new thing to think about every day. It's stressful. But it's a new thing to think about every day. You know, when you got started in your career and Betty says to you, take risks, and you've used language and communicating with your team about being uncomfortable and be wildly creative and bold, really entrepreneurial type language. And, and I it, grip the table. And you are gripping the table. In an institutional setting, right? So on the one hand, the kinds of investments you're talking about in a spin out and a new fund and a new organization have that flavor. On the other hand, you say, boy, seven years ago, you started with this farm team and seven years later, we're not sure we're comfortable enough to step up. How do you put those two things together? I think the thing that we do is we do incredibly good research because we are in the business of taking risk. We know that we will not always be right but we created a structure where everybody on the team is responsible for identifying and unearthing risk, right? So you may bring something that's a little esoteric and it's a little weird and it's a little risky. So everybody sits around and talk about, tell me all the ways this could go wrong. Take an example in your head of something you've done recently. Either share what it is or the type of investment. And what does that mean, the risks of what could go wrong? So someone brings a manager in, somebody else on the team says, you know, I had a structure like that before. It wasn't in this space. It was in this other space. And here's what happened. And I got burnt. And here's the thing that the manager did that maybe wasn't exactly what I wanted. Or I co-invested, not co-invested, but I was a co-LP with this fund. Here's what motivates them. That's very different than what motivates us. And they're asking for this term because this is how they run their portfolio. And that will hurt us if they get that term. So either you have to decide you don't want to be in there or you need to find a term that protects you if they do that stuff. Or someone will say, I know these three people who have invested with them before. Before you do that, you should talk to these three people because um, one of the things I've heard about them is that they're quick to get scared when the markets get choppy. And so that's a portfolio construction, a portfolio management risk, and maybe you should think about that. And it's all sorts of things. I mean, you name it, someone has seen it before. If you're experienced enough, I've seen it before. Something, there are other people that we'll talk about. We try a lot more to leverage our relationships with peers outside of the organization and just let everybody spend a lot of time just figuring out what the risks are because then we can just at least put some arms around it and then we can feel more comfortable 
doing things that are a little bit more strange than we might otherwise. And so we might spend twice as much time thinking about what could go wrong as we did about why this is a special opportunity. So it's painful sometimes. Like I said to my daughter the other day, so I have a 17 year old, she's about to go to college. And I said, you know, look, there are people out there who are going to live perfectly wonderful lives. They will never take any risks. They will be happy. They will have families. When they look back on their lives, they will feel good about it. And then there are people who decide they want to be great. And the people who decide they want to be great are uncomfortable all the time. You have to decide what you want to be. It's okay. To, either choice is good. It's a great choice to decide, I just want to do something that impacts the rest of this world and I'm going to be uncomfortable with it, but I know I'm going to do everything I can to feel good about it. Or I'm just going to play it safe and have a good life and not grind your teeth at night and not feel stressed out and whatever. And that's how I feel about the portfolio. There was a lot about the portfolio that was sleep at night type of investments. And now we have to decide whether we want to be great. And, wh and what's your thought? This team can be great. They can be. There's lots of competition in their life that gets in the way of greatness, right? We have kids. We have families. The volatility that comes with having a bonus one year and not having a bonus next year is real. They have to decide. And I have to decide. I mean, like, I'm, I'm not putting it just on them. But we all have to decide what greatness looks like for us and whether or not we're willing to do what it takes to be great. And not everybody's going to make the same decision. And I'm hoping that I can be brave, right? <laughs> like every day I hope that I can be brave. Well, if somebody wanted to expand their horizons and be great, what should they do on their 50th birthday? <laughs> so, <laughs> funny you should say that. <laughs> so when I turned 50, I decided that I was going to do 50 things I had never done before. And the criteria for those 50 things was it just had to be something that I'd never done before and that I thought would make the next 50 years better than the last 50 years, which meant they could be big or small. Some of them were free. Some of them were not free. Some of them made me incredibly uncomfortable. And some of them were like, they're just sort of interesting. So I'm glad I did. start with either a laundry list or stories. Got to hear about some okay. of these. So I did an open door helicopter ride around New York City. They tether you in so you can't fall out. Crazy. I would have never <laughs> done that. Some of them are a little bit more uncomfortable for me as a person, but everybody else will think this is why, I don't know why you're uncomfortable with this. So I never go to the galas, the New York City galas, all the, you know, proof of galas, not my scene, not, you know, not the people I'm most comfortable with, not going to go it. Somebody asked me, I'm going because I've never done them. I'm going to go to one. And I talked my husband into going to this thing with me. We go. We are literally the only black people in the whole room, right? So here we are. Not that I haven't spent my life being the only black person in the room, but for sure, here we are. And because I don't go to these things, I'm so dumb. We drive to the gala, right? Yeah. Which is, not, is only a problem because we drive to the park gala, which means we have to park the car. Now we're walking through the streets of New York City with a gown and a tux on. And homeless people are like, looking good. Where are you guys going, right? Where every single other person has been driven up by their driver <laughs> to the car. We are cracking up laughing at the fact that like, so this was a, a fail. We, we were supposed to take a car here. <laughs> but we had the best time, right? Like it was a different experience. I'm so glad I did it. It was fun. You know, I had a great time. Probably won't do very many of those again, but I'm glad I did it. Every place that I went for work that was a different city, I found out which restaurants were Michelin star restaurants, and I went. And, you know, I'm here. If I could get a reservation, I went. And some of them were the dumpling restaurant in Hong Kong, and some of them was per se here in New York. So I did that because I'm a foodie. I love food. That was fun. I went to the Taj Mahal by myself. I decided I was going to walk 100 miles a month, which meant I couldn't take the subways anymore. I had to walk everywhere. And I recorded it with my iWatch. So I did that. I walked. I decided I was going to try five new exercises that I'd never tried before. So I did. Burpees in the office? Oh, my God. Crazy <laughs> stuff. I did. I did shadow boxing. I did. You name it. If somebody said, come do this thing with me, I, okay, I'll do that. And it was awesome. And some things I will never do again. What's the one thing you know you'll never do again? I guess maybe really what I should have said is some of them are not things 
that I would choose to do. choose to do again. But I would like I did some crazy massage things at some like spiritual. I don't even know what they're called. And I was <laughs> was it horrible? No. But am I likely to sign up for it again? No. You know. Yeah. Probably the most unusual is that somebody here at Carnegie knew the ectomologist at the Museum of Natural History. And they took me on a tour behind the scenes and let me touch this fish that is closer to a human than to a salmon. It has elbows. And they think this is what became humans. That was kind of cool. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing year. And I would I tell people, everybody I see, I say, Ted, when you turn 50. It's coming. Do it's it. Coming pretty soon. <laughs> you All will right. enjoy it. It's like one a week. You can do it. Yeah. All right, Kim, some closing questions for you. What was your favorite sports moment? So I will start off by saying I am the least athletic person you will ever know. I, from when I was two years old, wore glasses. And I think kids who wear glasses naturally don't become sports kids, right? So it's not something. But probably my favorite sports moment was when Serena Williams won the Australian Open in 2007. It just, it just was an amazing that, Was comeback. that her first? Was no, that, it was that her was first. when she, she was not even ranked. Yeah. So she had not been playing and then she just came back and it was pretty amazing right like the, the whole idea that you can just decide to like sort of get yourself together and and make a comeback was pretty amazing what teaching from your parents has most stayed with you my father used to say all the time proper planning prevents piss poor performance all the time all right let's get that a lot of peas there proper planning prevents piss poor performance all right my father was a marine I had to do military corner bed making. It's just a very, very disciplined. I learned the Marine Corps hymn before I learned my ABCs, probably. Just a very sort of, he really believed strongly that if you, you just have to plan things out. And if you don't plan things out, then you will not be prepared. And if you are not prepared, you will not perform well. And I think that's probably the thing that stayed most with me. And I'm, I'm maybe an over planner sometimes. What information do you read that you get a lot out of that other people might not be exposed to? I was an organizational behavior major. I love books about like sort of human behavior and the way people think and the thinking fast and slow books, the blink books, the, the give and take, all those kind of like what are humans like and how they develop. I think people either read fiction or they read nonfiction. And if they're business people, they read business books. I read all of them, right? I just, if somebody recommends a book to me, I'll read it. And I think having sort of a, a broader sense of the way different people think and the, the way different people experience the world has made a difference. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? To breathe. I think I sometimes am the person who worries too much and for sure, like I said, when I was in HBS, one of my issues was I couldn't speak up in class. Worries too much. I worried too much about what people would think. I wish I had learned earlier that nobody knows everything. And you just sort of have to put yourself out there and just hope for the best. And sometimes you're going to look dumb. And guess what? You'll get up. You'll still be breathing. And, and you know, now I'm willing to look stupid. And I wasn't willing to look <laughs> stupid when I was younger. All right. One more. It's your waning days. You are sitting in your rocking chair thinking about the hundred things you've done after your hundredth birthday year. What advice would you give yourself today? Enjoy your children more. I spend a lot of my time with my kids. The best thing I will do in this world is the legacy of my kids. And so my guess is that I'm going to, no matter how much time I spend with them, and I, like, I feel like I spend a lot of time, no matter how much time I spend with them, I'm going to think to myself, I wish I had spent more time with them because they, I hope, will be amazing people. And I, I think they're super interesting now. So when they're adults, they're going to be really interesting. And I'm going to wish I had spent more time with them and my grandkids and everybody else. And, um, but I think I'm going to be really proud of them. I think I'm going to be really proud of my grandkids. So Great I'll tell you the stuff. question you didn't ask me that I was like, I hope he asked me this All right, question, what question because everybody he's asked this question for has given him fake answers. And I'm going to ask him, what you. do I do that's a total waste of time? Okay. Kim, what do you do that's a total waste of time? I am addicted to television. 
What kind of television? All kinds. Junk, good, bad. I watch way too much TV. And everybody has given you these answers is like, you know, my biggest fault is that I'm a perfectionist. No. <laughs> my biggest waste of time is a true waste of time. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of TV that is of no value except for maybe it's a stress decompressor. And it just keeps you from Maybe. being too crazy. Though I remember watching 24 in the heyday, and I stopped watching because it was increasing my stress levels. So was- it- <laughs> well, Game of Thrones increases my stress Yeah, levels. I haven't watched Game of Thrones. That's why. <laughs> but I love it anyway. <laughs> Great. Kim, thanks so much. No problem. It's a pleasure. Hey, before you take off, I've started sending out a monthly email that shares a small selection of what caught my eye over the month. I get a lot of emails like this, and I'm sure you do too. So I'm only going to send no more than a handful of the very best things that caught my eye. If you'd like to receive that email, hop on my website at capitalallocatorspodcast.com and join the mailing list.